Mr. Frank Gorman to David Gracie, Lawrence, Massachusetts, August the, today the 8th, the 8th, 1973. Um, well, let's start at the beginning. You were born in England. Uh, tell me about that. Who were your parents? Were they um, uh, uh, born in Bradford, Yorkshire? Or if I was English, I was... And left there when uh, born in 1890. Left there when uh, I was 13. And went into the mills in Rhode Island. Why did you leave? Poverty. Oh, destitution. The Labor Party was just coming in to. Uh, in the ascendancy, in the abject poverty, in those days. No benefits, just like it was in the States that there was no, no, uh, no remedial or social benefits. Had your parents worked in the mill? They did. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did they follow you over they there? They in the mills. No, they came first, and then I came oh, along. Oh, and worked in the mills in uh, in Rhode Island. Did they have an arrangement before they came over, or did they just come and hoping for they the They just came. Yeah, they had to get away. Mm -hmm. So they started in the mills, and then you followed them in. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. I worked in the mills in uh, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, right here in Lawrence, too, until 1922. And then uh, I was the president of uh, the National War Sorters and the Graders Association. <laughs> and they came out on strike here, and I had to come to Lawrence to. Uh, to manage the strike. And that was in 1922. And, uh, we were on strike for six months. Well, now, how did you, had you worked in a, in a mills before you came to Rhode Island? No. What? Not in England. I worked as a, uh, what they call them in England, the penny runners for the post office. So, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and, uh, Delivering telegraphs. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah. Did you also go to school during that time? I went to school to the uh, parochial school, the Jesuits, mm -hmm. in Bradford. And then that ended the schooling. Mm -hmm. Was your family Catholic? Catholic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How did you get, had you uh, been in a union in uh, England, or did you join first when you came here? No, I joined when I came here. Mm -hmm. the, uh, I worked in about all of the departments of the uh, mills, and then went as an apprentice wool sorter. Mm -hmm. We had to serve three years. Uh, that meant the uh, sorting the fleece off the sheep's back, you know, the, the raw, uh, uncleansed uh, fleece. And he uh, sorted out into different grades. Mm -hmm. and I served three years and then worked as a wool sorter here in, uh, in Rhode Island uh, until 1922. That's 51 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, started, uh, my career, whatever it was. And, uh, did you first join the National Wool Sorters and Graders? Yes. Mm -hmm. Was there a choice or was that the only one? None of the only one. None of the only organization. And, uh, Were you active with it from the first uh, holding office and all sort of thing? Uh, almost from the first. It was in uh, existence uh, before I joined. Uh, comprised mostly of journeymen, they call them journeymen from England. Mm -hmm. uh, now, 
in uh, Lawrence here, you have the different situation. The, uh, the Italians were the working force here. They were brought to Lawrence by Wood, the president of the American Woolen Company. Mm -hmm. Owned most of those mills on both sides of the Merrimack, which you saw now. And uh, when the situation developed uh, after that strike, there had been a uh, Lawrence in 1912. Very, uh, my strike was mild in comparison with what happened in 1912. Mm -hmm. They had to uh, send all of the children away from Lawrence. Mm -hmm. The situation got so serious. And, uh, it was uh, that strike was conducted by Joe Vanetti. Joe Vanetti was a, uh, a poet, by the way. Mm -hmm. Joe Vanetti and Joe Edda ran that strike. And as it developed, uh, Bill Haywood came in here, the IWW, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and they had all kinds of uh, trouble in the courts, killings, and evictions, and, uh, and that was, uh, but at that time I was working in the plant, in the mill. Mm -hmm. I just came in here to look things over. So this, uh, this uh, Lawrence is the, uh, this was the battleground mm -hmm. of the Texan industry. It was the largest uh, segment of the industry. And what, they, uh, what Wood did, he brought over the Italians and, uh, mm -hmm. from Italy, which was different from the uh, you heard about Fall River in New Bedford. Mm -hmm. well, that's cotton. It's, uh, Lawrence is woolen, or was woolen. But those mills in Fall River in New Bedford were uh, manned by uh, people from England. The uh, old trade unionists, craft trade unionists. And they had their own uh, craft organizations. Just about that time, <coughs> I was starting to talk about an industrial union, you know. Finally got into it from the CIO. Well, was the 1912 strike the first one that you had seen? Outside of some small strikes in Rhode Island. It was a big strike I'd experienced. How, what kind of experience did you have directing a strike before this 1922 one? Oh, not any as a matter of fact. Hmm. Not as a field man. I mm -hmm. mean, locally, I took part in the, uh, in the uh, small strike situations. I was the uh, president of the Central Labor Council in the Parliament. Parliament the Central Labor Union, the legislative agent for the uh, Federal State Federation of Labor, mm -hmm. and I participated in the local strikes, but no, nothing of this nature. Mm -hmm. Was it easy to get uh, um, involved in union activity, I mean, in working up in the offices, or was there no, great competition? Well, well I had some, no, there wasn't any competition. I was the uh, president of um, the local and my local in Parliament for uh, 12 years because we couldn't get anyone else to serve. Oh. There wasn't any competition. Mm -hmm. but one reason was discrimination. That oh. I've been uh, discharged for union uh, membership uh, oh, two or three times, you know. And, uh, so the, uh, the average member just refused to take office, mm -hmm. which is entirely different now because of this competition. Mm -hmm. Was the Providence local uh, composed of uh, 
the people of an English background, or did you have most a, of them? Most of them, and, uh, but it was being integrated by the uh, new apprentices, you know, that were born in this country. And you went in there at uh, three years, the first year. Uh, when I worked in the, uh, before I went as an apprentice, I worked in the uh, mills in uh, Providence. As a matter of fact, the mills that I worked in were controlled by the Juilliard interests, the music mm -hmm. foundation people. Mm -hmm. And I worked there for them uh, 70 hours a week for four dollars and 18 cents. Mm -hmm. I remember the 18 cents because that's what I got. <laughs> <laughs> and then when uh, went into the uh, woodsawing trade, uh, six dollars the first year, twelve dollars. And fifteen dollars, which was a journeyman's pay in the days of third year. Mm -hmm. So I stayed there until I came here. Mm -hmm. And then I went from here to Salem. There's two Salem's here. Salem, New Hampshire, and Salem, Massachusetts. Salem, Massachusetts, as you know, is the uh, home of uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne mm -hmm. and the Seven Gables. I went into the uh, a sheeting mill, the pre sheeting mill. All they made was uh, sheets and pillowcases. Mm. And I had uh, very little experience in the mechanics and the operations of the sheeting industry. So uh, the local people, they had a, a complete union shop which is a novelty in those days. Mm. But they had the checkoff, and uh, mm. this is around 1923 or 24. They're completely unionized, but their competition from uh, other trademark sheets in the South, the, uh, the migratory movement was just starting then, going down South, and uh, they couldn't compete. Mm. with the Pequot sheets. So I went and stayed in the plant. Uh, we had an office in the plant there. And then afterwards, after a while, I went uh, all through the country where the uh, sheeting mills were located in the south, Pepperell and uh, Utica Mohawk, and all of the trademark sheets. We didn't do very good in organizing them, but we managed to uh, narrow the competition to the point of where we were able to maintain our conditions in Salem. But that's all gone now. The, uh, they had a complete modern union uh, plan there. But after a while, it, uh, they, they, they couldn't withstand the competition, and it, it finally, uh, there's still some of it there, but now the, the shooting industries in the South, mm -hmm. where, the, where the textile industry is now, as a matter of fact, more of a million textile workers in the uh, continental United States. between the two unions. You know about the CIO union, mm -hmm. the Textile Workers Union of America and the United Textile Workers. Between the two unions, the industries are little more than uh, one-third organized, mm -hmm. with most of the non-union workers in the South, mm -hmm. south of the, the Potomac. And we worked down there. Very little help in those days. And as a matter of fact, I was down there all over for quite a while. Mm -hmm. And then got involved with strikes down there in uh, Gastonia, Marion, uh, Elizabethton. Was your main purpose in going down there uh, the first time to organize in the South? 
was the main purpose to sort of save the situation in the north, or was the purpose to unionize the people in the south? That's the second part is right, to unionize the people in the south, because we knew, we knew where the movement was. I mean, we, uh, we uh, mistakenly tried to tell the people in the north that this threat, they were just threatening to move in the 20s, that they were bluffing, that they wanted to get rid of the unions, but they, uh, they weren't bluffing, they just moved. Mm. And, uh, we dared them to move, and they took the dare, and they moved. Yeah. That's what happened. Mm. And uh, until now, like as you know, in Lawrence, there's, uh, well, there isn't anything here in the line of uh, genuine textiles. I mean, from the from the raw material to the uh, this garment here, but uh, but it's all gone. Same thing in Fall River. New Bedford, a little bit, not much left. Rhode Island, New Hampshire, Maine, they have uh, still textiles there, but the, uh, the largest part of the industry is down south now. When did you become president of the National Wool Growers and Graders? And that would be in 1913. Good, man. Did you work up through the organization? Yes. With secretary uh, treasurer and this sort of thing? No, we had a secretary treasurer. Matter of fact, he lived right here hmm. in Lawrence. And he was an old time English oh. trade unionist. And uh, he held on until he died here uh, some years ago. Hmm. But I worked up to it and uh, finally. Uh, was elected president of the National, and then later on uh, became the organizer for the UTW. Mm -hmm. How big was the uh, National uh, World War? Well, it was a trade organization, right. a limited uh, group. Uh, perhaps uh, all together in the National, we didn't have any more than about 2,000 members. Mm -hmm. But that's all, it was pretty well organized, the wood uh, sorters. Mm -hmm. Right. The wool sorters and the loop fixers mm -hmm. are uh, recognized as the uh, the basic trade unions of the industry, and they clung to this uh, narrow trade organizations. They constantly refused to. Uh, affiliate or join with the other people in the plants hmm. until the advent of the CIO, which was back in uh, 
and we started on that uh, campaign down there. And the campaign made some progress, but not on textile. Mm -hmm. Until one day a call came in from uh, Danville at the loom fixes. You see, the loom fixes again constantly come into this uh, situation, that they were out on strike. Mm -hmm. And Smith, who was the chairman of our committee, said, look, uh, Frank, do you want to go up there and find out what it's all about? I said, well, how long will it take? He said, oh, maybe a, a week, 10 days. Well, I went in there, and I was there two years, in there. <laughs> terrific experience, terrible experience, not only terrific. Hot on the strike. <coughs> Excuse me. We try to prevent the strike, but the constant discrimination, victimization of the workers uh, compel the membership to strike regardless of the leadership. In these days and times, discrimination, of course, it means black versus white. Is that? Rampant. No, no, no. What, what no, does no, it no, mean? Very, mean? very little. Uh, no color situation there. As a matter of fact, the, uh, the colored people were not allowed to work in the operation of the sure, industry. Their labor was in the yard mm -hmm. and the heavy work. Mm -hmm. It's changed now, but that's the way it was then. There was no colored situation because the, the colored people were just held down and uh, there was very little they could do about it. And then again, the colored people were hesitant about joining the union in those days. They finally did. We have organization in Danville now with uh, colored people. And there's very little, uh, the situation has changed entirely. Well, what did discrimination mean then? Well, it, it meant that the uh, the first thing they did was discharge them from their job, mm. and they were company houses. They put them out of their homes, <coughs> and they were, well, they were just stayed there destitute. Mm. And that went on for, uh, oh, the strike went on for nine or ten months during a terrible winter, one of the uh, worst winters the South had ever known. But we were uh, finally driven back hmm. into the plant with thousands of people victimized, who, by the way, uh, secured employment elsewhere, and uh, in fact uh, provided the uh, leadership for whatever organization the two unions now have in the South. It was an educational uh, mm -hmm. campaign for them, uh, and a terrible loss, but a gain for the uh, in the long run for the organization. Mm -hmm. well, now the newspapers said that uh, uh, the newspapers ridiculed the union after that because they said that. Um, that uh, the union claimed to have had an agreement with the company to take these strikers back, and then the company didn't take them back. Um, was there an agreement? Did the company uh, renege on it? Never. You're talking about Danville. Right. You've heard about it before. Mm -hmm. huh? Never an agreement. The president of the company was a man named Fitzgerald. He was a deaf mute. Hmm. And uh, he vowed and kept his uh, vow that he'd die before he'd recognize the Union. And he did just that. He never recognized or made any agreement with the Union. Green came in here, came into Danville, and uh, we had uh, certain people, specialists, people to take care of the children, uh, people to take care of the, uh, the commissary, the uh, relief, and uh, we had a scientific 
expert to study the uh, efficiency of the plant. Oh, that was Jeffrey Brown? That's who it was. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's just who it was, Jeffrey Brown. And Green came in, and uh, I stayed at the Burton Hotel there. Green came in, and they were having a, uh, it was a meeting of the Kiwanis mm. Club luncheon. And uh, I knew Fitzgerald was going to uh, be at that luncheon, and I, uh, somehow or other, Bill Green got in there. And he did make overtures to talk to uh, Fitzgerald, but it, uh, it never occurred, and there wasn't any contact, and the situation just uh, wore itself out. And that was uh, 29 and 30. Mm -hmm. In the Depression, you see, we had three strikes against us before the strike ever started. There wasn't any possibility of uh, getting a settlement because the industry was down. They could afford it. Do in New I mean, they could have, they could afford to uh, stop manufacturing, which they did. Well, now Danville was, uh, as I understood it, was one of the uh, conditions were among the best in the South. Doesn't mean they were good, but they were among the best. Why? That's right. Why? That's true. Uh, uh, didn't you all um, take on another, uh, well, a, a weaker company? Well, we did. We did, but uh, we operated from the uh, belief that we could uh, prove an example right. to, to the others, you see. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, of course, the opposition in those days was violent to the Union. Bloody, I mean, really violent. I got uh, got mixed up with the uh, strike in Marion, and Elizabethton, and Gastonia, where there was violence and murders and killings. And uh, mm. but now it's it's bloodless. It, it isn't bloody now. The industry, but it's more scientific. The Southern employer has learned and found out how to keep the union away from the plants. I mean, the big, uh, the big company, Burlington, of course, is mm -hmm. the biggest. Mm -hmm. And uh, with one exception, as far as I know, the Textile Workers Union has one local in Burlington. Hmm. Burlington. The cannon interest. We had a we had a strike in uh, cannon in uh, Concord and Kannapolis in 1919. This was before I went on the uh, road, and uh, we struck that and started a campaign to feed the people. And the union placed a dollar assessment on the membership. didn't turn out very well. We lost about half of the membership. And that strike petered out, you see. Cannon, Burlington, the Cone interests, and Greensboro. <coughs> the, uh, my memory's pretty good, but I'm thinking about the people in Alabama. Well, it'll come back, sure. Did did uh, President Green give you all the support in Danville that you thought he should? He, or he gave us support, but not enough to take care of the. Uh, we uh, well, it's about uh, eight or nine thousand workers involved in that strike, the big strike. There wasn't any. Uh, possibility of uh, paying strike benefits. The union didn't have any funds for strike benefits. So the uh, AFABEL, uh, I went round to uh, the organizations, went to the conventions in uh, 
the United States and Canada uh, asking for help, and we got help all right. We had uh, the commissary, fairly well stocked with supplies and uh, coal. We needed coal very badly. Finally, we made a connection with a friend of ours from Virginia, a coal owner who uh, provided us with coal that wasn't the best kind, it, uh, but it helped. Mm -hmm. So we, we did manage to uh, receive a substantial support, but still insufficient to take care of the demand. And that, of course, has been the situation in Texas from the beginning. Like when we go from uh, 2930 to the general strike in 34, well, uh, at one time we had 500,000 people out. Well, there wasn't a possibility. I mean, if you gave them a dollar a week, it would uh, mm -hmm. run into the millions, you know, inside of a month. And uh, there wasn't a chance of providing the financial support. We got support for that from the AFL, but then the, uh, we knew it couldn't last very long. It was uh, sort of a... Uh, it was uh, sort of a... And it was uh, the leadership. Uh, I was the vice president then. Who ran was the president. Uh, there wasn't a thing the leadership could do. They demanded a strike and they struck. So they sent me into Washington to open an office and uh, conduct the strike and they. All I had was 10 days to prepare for it. And we opened an office in Washington. I was uh, living there then, working for the, uh, with the NRA. And uh, we had, uh, realizing the lack of uh, academic training that I had, situation became a national issue. As a matter of fact, the uh, 
some uh, wise guy found out that I was born in England. And it was quite possible I didn't have my naturalization papers and I could be deported. Fortunately, I had my papers, but the Ma Perkins, uh, Secretary of Labor, called me and said, you, you better get those papers here quickly. And I was, my family was in Providence. I wrote and got them, and that sort of went out. But then they talked about a, uh, a national revolution, and they invaded in the Something it wasn't, you know, but the, uh, the employees' organization is more powerful than us, and they just put it over on us. But Roosevelt, uh, finally, he, he was uh, constant and through Mrs. Roosevelt and her connections, trying to make <coughs> excuse me, contact with the uh, owners and uh, Roosevelt, we knew, had the contact with Callaway. And they finally uh, got to the point of where Roosevelt called me from Hyde Park at about the end of the third week. His secretary, Steve Early, got me and he said, the president is here and he's, you've got to settle this straight. I said, how am I going to settle it? I mean, I didn't call it in the first place, the union. Well, he said, the president wants it out of the way. So I said, well, there's anything I can do, Mr. Early, on the call the executive board. And, uh, so I did. And Roosevelt said he'd uh, see to it that there wasn't any discrimination. That we'd have... Uh, a study, a committee to study the situation, and a few other things. No concessions, in, by the way, of uh, wages, but this, this study commission, which he appointed, but uh, the fact of the matter was Roosevelt couldn't make good on the uh, victimization. We had again, you see, thousands of victims out of that strike. And I uh, believe, looking back, and these guys call it hindsight, that he, uh, he tried to do something. I know Mrs. Roosevelt tried very hard. She had influential friends around the country. But they, uh, there again, we were forced back. Uh, to repeat the Danville situation, out of that strike came a, uh, the leadership that now comprises the two unions in the, uh, in the textile industry, the UTW and the TW or Textile Workers Union. It developed this leadership, uh, most of whom are uh, active today. Most of these people in here uh, went through that strike or heard about it mm -hmm. and, and um, got their training through the uh, experience of that. On this 1934 strike, why did Roosevelt want it uh, settled? Was it... Uh, well, he was, been, he was been pressed by the Manufacturers Association. Mm -hmm. and this, uh, in my opinion, uh, by Callaway principally, Hmm. who was powerful in the industry, still powerful in, in, in Georgia. But the, uh, uh, I'm thinking now about the, uh, the Callaway that's the, uh, He's part of the Nixon administration now, no. isn't he? What, the young man? Yeah, I, yeah, I mm. think so. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Roosevelt did what he could. He appointed these boards and commissions. And uh, 
Uh, the government gave us uh, all of the uh, academic assistance we needed to compete with the employers. And we carried on the negotiations for a whole bunch of years, as a matter of fact. And that started whatever success has happened in textiles. And we have some good union <coughs> now. <coughs> Textile Workers Union has good unions. Some of these people in here from the Anchor and uh, Elizabeth, big plants, powerful plants. But mostly in the uh, synthetics. Mm -hmm. The man-made fibers, instead of the natural fibers of cotton and wool, the uh, predominant membership in the industry today comes from man-made fibers and not the natural fibers. But of course, you know, the tendency is now for the uh, man-made fibers. I'm for that. Right? Oh, yeah, I'm for the other way. Mm -hmm. Well, that's... Uh, Prefer the natural. That's the development now. That's the industry. Where years ago, you'd, uh, your suit was made out of wool. Well, people don't buy the suits that way now. I mean, it's, it's a mixture of synthetics and man-made fibers. And uh, the uh, mechanics of the industry, the operations, not basically modernized to the fact where they were, they're now turning out the, uh, the fabrics that are mixtures of cotton and wool, but mostly synthetics. So we went all through that period and developed unions until the, today, while we're the uh, when we reached uh, oh, about 37. That was the advent of the uh, CIO, Congress of Industrial Organizations. Now the workers are accepting the idea, regardless of the trade, the uh, narrow trade union idea of crafts. Mm -hmm. They're now accepting the, uh, the plan of industrial unionism. And then we had the advent of the steel workers, the automobile workers, the chemical workers, all new unions up to that time, you see. Mm -hmm. And now almost completed their organization. Well, the automobile, steel, and electric, and chemical, rubber, they have almost completed their organization. But steel textiles is, uh, they're down from the standpoint of membership. And the only opportunity we have now of regulating the wages in the textile industry is through the example of the organized textile workers. And every time uh, we get a raise, uh, the employers, they've, uh, they decide they'll give the raise. So they get what we get. The mm -hmm. membership gets what we get without uh, being part of the movement. And that's the way the situation stands today. Joe Jacobs suggested that, um, or he wanted me to ask you if you thought that uh, Roosevelt's personal failure to um, uh, get the victims of the 1934 strike taken care of uh, Mr. Jacobs thought that led to some of um, FDR's legislation with regard to labor to, the, uh, to improve the labor situation, some of those acts in uh, 35 and so forth. Do you think that's the case? Do you think that's correct. Out of it, out of that textual strike, it's recognized in the labor movement, we got the Wagner Act. Mm -hmm. You see, now we're going from uh, 34 all through the Roosevelt administration. And all of the uh, 
all of the planned reforms that the Roosevelt people had in mind were coming into effect. Now we got the Wagner out, the Wagner out, minimum wages, social security. We had nothing before Roosevelt. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the only thing in the textile industry up to that time was uh, factory inspection. Mm -hmm. A little workman's compensation in the States, but nothing until uh, Roosevelt instituted and successfully carried out the, uh, the social movement, social reform movement. I agree with that. Uh, well, J uh, Jacobs, well, Joe's like myself. The only difference is he's getting old and I am old. But I'm trying to put him in, uh, in those days. He uh, he should know something about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then all of these uh, studies and these uh, his research work. Let me go back a minute here. When did the uh, National Wool Growers and uh, Wool Sorters and Graders uh, did it uh, uh, come into the UTW? How did you get from one to the other? That's right. That's uh, we uh, we were a separate organization, mm -hmm. the National Wool Sorters and Graders Association. We called it the National Wool Sorters and Graders Association because we. We took in membership on, on, on the ranches, the sheep ranches, Good, yeah. where the fleeces were graded, not mm -hmm. sorted. And after the graders graded them, they'd ship it in uh, in bags, packages to the mills. Mm -hmm. And then we do the sorting. Mm -hmm. That's where all the graders come in. Did you have much membership on the ranches? Not much on the, with the graders. We had some, but very little. We had no means of, uh, we didn't have sufficient funds to carry on the national campaign. But the old English custom of uh, trade unionism was effective insofar as that crap was concerned. Mm -hmm. And they maintained uh, uh, substantial organization in the, uh, in the, world, uh, the world centers like Lawrence, Providence. Philadelphia. Uh, well, it would take about uh, perhaps a dozen locals in the national, you see, restricted just to the wool sorters. And then occasionally some of our people would be selected to go out on the ranches to grade. Mm -hmm. Well, they maintain their membership. But never. Uh, never to the point of where we uh, we could uh, develop a complete organization whereby we could bargain nationally with the employers we bargain locally with the employers and uh, we were then a separate union outside of the AFL but my local union joined the United Textile Workers and uh, largely because in our locality in Rhode Island, we were a small local union operating uh, alone, you see. And it occurred to some of us we should be part of the general labor movement. Mm -hmm. So we joined the UGW and became affiliated with the uh, Central Labor Union, the State Federation of Labor. And uh, most of the other locals, like Lawrence, finally they joined too. But then we had some holdouts to the point of where some of them, some of the locals, refused to go in. Mm -hmm. But that's when we became part of the uh, the uh, national labor movement, and uh, also believing in the. Uh, in the advancement of industrial unionism. In other words, that the wool sorters should uh, take in uh, or be taken in by the 
the general workers in the mills, from the from the pick room to the cloth room, mm -hmm. everyone should be in it. And that's really what started the uh, industrial union in this country. About when did your local uh, go over to the UTW? That would be in uh, that would be in nineteen. Uh, 1912. Hmm. I remember that I uh, finished my apprenticeship in 1911, and uh, the place where I worked was completely organized, and they they brought me into the union immediately after I finished my apprenticeship, and that was 1911. So the, uh, the transfer to the national, international uh, union came around 1912, I'd say. Well, now, you, I, I think you said you were president of the National Wool Sorters and Graders in, uh, as late as 1922. Were you in both? Well, that's how I came to right. come along. Okay, well, then you were in both at the same time. Right. I see, right. I see. That's right. Mm -hmm. And our secretary here, George Breer, had been secretary for uh, a long time before I took office. He took care of the finances, didn't have very much. But the UTW financed uh, me when I came here. Uh -huh. They put me on the uh, payroll, the UTW payroll, at $35 a week. And uh, I lived in a hotel next to and an office corner of Broadway and Essex Street here, and I lived next door at the Franklin for two dollars a night. <laughs> we managed. Mm -hmm. We managed a lot. When did you become an officer of the United Textile Workers? In, uh, in 19, uh, 1920. I think the Baltimore or Philadelphia Convention. I was elected vice president. Mm -hmm. And then went on to uh, 1937. And in the interim, there was real competition for the, the movement was in the ascendancy, mm -hmm. the general labor movement. And the, uh, we came into the era of uh, competition. And there were struggles, internal struggles within the union for office. Uh, for example, <coughs> at the 1932 and 34 conventions, they made an effort to uh, substitute new leadership for the president. McMahon was the, uh, Tom McMahon was the president. He was a folder, a cloth folder, in Providence, too, in Rhode Island. And uh, the international itself was uh, organized in 1901. Fall River. It started in the cotton end of the industry. Fall River and New Bedford. The first president was uh, Tansy. The next was John Golden. He was a muse spinner. Tansy was a weaver. Golden was a muse spinner. McMahon was a folder. And when uh, Golden died, McMahon was vice president. And he took over. The office was in the uh, those days in the uh, Bible House in New York City. They moved the headquarters from Fall River hmm. into New York, and McMahon took over. Very uh, capable leader, uh, a real uh, sincere trade unionist, but. Uh, like all of us, he was uh, 
upset by the terrific opposition of the employers. And we struggled along with, uh, until the Depression, the 29th. And the membership almost dissolved in those days. And we struggled along until 34 when we organized the, oh, about 300,000. But here we again, we organized the workers, but we didn't unionize. Mm -hmm. There's a difference. Mm -hmm. For the lack of manpower and money. In fact, I always had an idea that if we had money, when I was working in the South in the 20s and 30s, we had uh, sufficient funds, we could organize the South. I was disabused of that idea, because when Lewis and Hillman, who had the money, Dabinsky took over, they not only had the money, but they had the manpower. And they used it. But still we didn't do it, you see. Hillman sent uh, dozens of organizers into the South. Lewis provided the funds. But still today, as I say to you, we only have a little more than one-third of the industry organized out of a million text awards. Is that because, uh, as you say, these people aren't educated to unionism? Is that the primary reason? <clears throat> well, they're not educated to uh, Unionism, the, uh, the uh, operation for textile worker and the inducement to become a member in the large measure when they're in trouble, when they have a grievance. Mm -hmm. and when that grievance arises, whether it's money or fringe benefits or like the, uh, what they call the stretch-out system. Mm -hmm. They did call it the stretch-out then, in those days. Uh, then they joined the union. But the problem then is to unionize them mm -hmm. into permanent union. And the stretch-out, by the way, the, uh, it became a recognized word. It's in the dictionary, as a matter of fact. But it happened with a southern textile worker. He was standing outside the mill one day, and uh, I wasn't there, but they tell me in uh, South Carolina, the lunch hour, and someone came in and uh, came out there and asked him how he was doing. He says, I'll tell you how I was doing. I was stretched out so far that I'll never get back into shape. And the word took on. It was the stretch out. Mm -hmm. We fought in 1934. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, uh, more important than the wages. The system had become so uh, excessive and killing that that was the issue. Mm -hmm. The elimination of the stretch out. And uh, after a while, it, it did become better in the interest of, uh, in self-interest as far as the employers, but they recognized it mm -hmm. and they did make the changes. And when we develop unions, wherever we develop them, we now have agreements that uh, the operation uh, must be considered a part of collective bargaining and that the worker has something to do with his own job employment. So we've made progress. And even in the non-union mills today, the system, the stretch out, isn't as excessive as it was in those days. So the union is making the improvement, but we still maintain a minimum of member membership. Mm -hmm. uh, in the sequence again now, we've gone from uh, 
1920s to the 1970s. Let me ask you one other question in here regarding the problems of organizing in the South and, and maintaining the uh, Union strength. Someone has suggested that one of the um, textile unions problems was federationism, the local unions wanting uh, control and the difficulty of the national in maintaining control over all of these organizations. Is that true? That's true. That's true. That's true. You see, because uh, when the, uh, for example, the Dyers, that was George Baldanzi's organization. As they developed their local unions, they uh, felt that the international wasn't doing sufficient. So they devised the dyers, the woolen worsted workers, the narrow fabric workers, and the cotton workers. They devised the, the hosiery workers, particularly because they were the strongest unit in the international, principally from uh, Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, composed mostly of, uh, originally of German people that were uh, particularly skilled in the making of hosiery, mm -hmm. women's hosiery, uh, chiefly, and men's. But they were the dominant organization within the international more stable and permanent. And they started the movement for the federations. Mm -hmm. And it did end up with the uh, federations being established and uh, dividing the authority with the international unions. Uh, but today, uh, it's gradually uh, resulted in returning to the system of the international union as opposed to federation. And we don't have them. We have the councils now, the local councils, state councils. Well, how did the international overcome it? How did they uh, get over it? They didn't try to overcome it. They had to accept it. No. Yeah, but, uh, the uh, leadership uh, while they um, uh, claimed that uh, it was a necessary development, nevertheless uh, understood that with it would come the, uh, the taking away of uh, some power from the international over to the Federation. But they accepted it. Mm -hmm. And the organization uh, went along with it for a few years. But now it's, uh, it's reverted back to where the, uh, where the control uh, comes back to the central organization. With some modification, for example, uh, 